Hello. <clears throat> hey everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Just trying to set up a few things here on my machine and we'll be ready shortly. So um, before I begin our lecture today, uh, let me just have a quick reminder. Um, so tomorrow um, you have one more thing that is due in the course, which is your project proposals. Um, I think I heard from most of you uh, what kind of projects you're planning to do, but I haven't heard from all of you yet. Um, like I said before, I would like to know what you're going to do in your course project so that we can put it into perspective with respect to whether it's going to be something tangible that you can achieve within the semester, whether it's something that you can, um, maybe it's too, too big of a project or too small of a project. On the other hand, um, I only heard from some of you, not all. So for those of you who haven't talked to me yet, please do talk to me before you submit your project proposals. Um, if you don't, then I don't know. Uh, there might be a risk that your project might not be in line with what the course is, um, is, is, is about, or maybe your focus or your uh, scale in the, in the project is, is too big to be uh, done within the remainder of the semester. And they will have to revisit this, that uh, either before your proposal presentation um, or after, which will just disrupt your timeline for your project. Uh, so please do reach out to me as soon as possible. You still have today, um, still have tomorrow, so you can do so. Um, proposals are going to be due on, uh, at 5 p.m. on the day. Uh, there's actually a maximum of two pages for it because I think I got a question earlier today about that. So it, it is two pages only, uh, and there is a reason for that. First, I don't want to read too long of a proposal, but more importantly, it's also an exercise of, for you to be uh, direct in your writing and just to the point. You don't have to um, um, write pages and pages to propose a new idea. So it's, it's both an exercise for you and also a way for me to distill the kind of ideas that you're going to come up with. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, I will uh, post the schedule for the proposal presentations. They're all going to be on Tuesday anyway, so it should be fine. I mean, expect to present on Tuesday regardless. Um, we're going to use our Zoom meeting um, for those presentations. Uh, so please uh, make sure that you um, have your um, slides ready. Um, um, some of the groups read that some of the groups do have more than one member, um, which means that if you're planning to uh, present all together the presentation, just make sure that when you transition, um, whomever is presenting at the moment will just switch off their shared slides and then the other person will share their own slides and then continue from there off. So make sure that you practice these kind of transitions beforehand so that it goes smoothly during the class time. Uh, proposal presentations are going to be uh, a five minute slot, three minutes for speaking, one minute for question and answer, and one minute to transition to the next speaker. Um, you can see all that information, by the way, is on eClass. If you go to eClass, go to the link where you have the assignment for the proposal document, you will see what I'm looking for. 
you will see the marking rubric for it as well so that you know exactly how I'm going to mark it. Uh, for the proposal presentation, uh, you will also see um, all the necessary details regarding it as well as the marking rubric as well um, and what to expect uh, from uh, what, I would, what I would be expecting from you in, 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 in the proposal presentation. Um, throughout the remainder of the course, uh, whenever you're presenting something, you're going to be evaluated for that presentation about the presentation itself. So in other words, like in your proposal, the document, there you're going to be graded on the content of the document. For the presentation, you're going to be primarily uh, graded for, um, uh, on the delivery of the presentation, not necessarily how I like or dislike your project idea. This is, this is really irrelevant in your presentation. And it's clear from the marking rubric that this is what I'm aiming for. Like I'm evaluating your presentation, not um, the content of the project itself or whether I think it is a good project or not. That will come through the document, that will come later in your final document and your final and and also, uh, yeah, that will come in your final document. There isn't uh, any other document that you're submitting for the project. Uh, I'm also tomorrow going to make available the paper assignments for the uh, paper seminars. Um, that would pretty much give you um, at least 10 days before the first paper seminar. So uh, that should be enough time for the first group of people who are going to present on the 27th. Uh, the third announcement that I would like to share is that on, <clears throat> on Thursday next week, so a week from today, we're going to have a guest lecture. Uh, two very senior researchers uh, and uh, colleagues of mine in, from Facebook that are going to talk to us about static analysis at Facebook, Francesco Lagozo and Ibrahim El Sayed. Uh, Francesco is from the static analysis team uh, from Facebook London, and Ibrahim El Sayed is from the security team at Facebook London as well. And they're going to talk to us about how they're using static analysis <coughs> within Facebook with a couple of frameworks there uh, to detect security vulnerabilities in, in, in the Facebook code base and how they leverage many of the theory that we have been discussing in the class so far uh, to actually build a very robust, reliable static analysis framework that they are using in practice uh, to the security vulnerabilities of Facebook. So um, stay tuned for more information. I'm going to share that within the eClass page and also through eClass. Uh, make sure that you have some time to attend uh, that lecture next week. Um, these are all the announce announcements that I have. Uh, do you have any questions or comments for me about any of what I said? Is email an okay way to reach out? Yes, email is okay. Uh, I will get to you as soon as I can. But if you email me uh, today or tomorrow, you're, you're fine. You don't have to schedule a meeting with me. Any other question? Sure. Yep. Yep. Right. Uh, that's a very good question. So the question is, um, if you propose something on Tuesday in your presentation and on Friday in your document, uh, and then halfway through the, the remainder of the semester, you find out, well, this is not working anymore. I want to change this, or I want to change a few things along the way, or maybe this is too complex to do within uh, the time uh, limit that we have. Uh, are you allowed to change anything? Absolutely, yes. The, you are allowed to change whatever is necessary to make it work for you. Um, I would go even further and then say, well, what if like, you find that, well, this is not working altogether and you want to change your project altogether. Uh, I'm also fine with that. However, uh, don't come and tell me that the day before your final presentation. Don't come and tell me that the day before you, you're submitting your final report. If you do that, this is not going to be accepted. This is too late. 
Um, so if you're if you're having any trouble with your project, if you're having any trouble with, um, and and by trouble I mean that you tried a few times a few things and they all don't work, and you came and asked me, you just can't get uh, useful information to proceed with the project. You you asked if as, and you couldn't get any help uh, to to from him for your project. Then at that point we can we can we can have a meeting and then decide what what is the best course of action. Uh, but changes are absolutely allowed, of course. I mean, this is the nature of research. This is this is a research project. It is not a a set in stone project like your regular undergrad course. Uh, and part of it is going to be you figuring out and navigating your way through it and figuring out what is feasible, what is not feasible, and so on. Any other? Sorry, is that is that does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? All right. <coughs> Sounds good. Uh, let's see if you can actually uh, I'm just gonna try something else here on Zoom and let me see if you can. Uh, let's see. There we go. So. I guess you can see this. You can, you can see me in the bottom right corner and, and then the iPad screen in the background for everyone, right? Is that, is that what you're seeing on Zoom? All right, perfect. So now we are actually seeing exactly what's on the Twitch live stream and I finally cracked it on the last kind of lecture that I'm delivering this way, but I finally got it just yesterday <laughs> to work. Uh, it seemed like a stupid misconfiguration in my in my zoom that didn't allow me to do this before all right so let's get started then so uh, where are we here so in in our lecture uh, on Tuesday uh, we continued our discussion with uh, IFDS uh, and the IFDS framework and how we can uh, build path edges and path summaries uh, that allow us to um, represent data flow, interprocedural data flow, as long as we have distributive uh, flow functions that describe what the analysis is doing. Uh, but then we also talked about some of the limitations of IFDS uh, with respect to uh, both the uh, 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 domain of the analysis uh, in terms of your domain is cannot be infinite because if the domain is infinite that would affect the complexity of your analysis or your algorithm basically it won't terminate uh, the second limitation is that since it is a subset problem uh, your merge operator has to be the set union and if you want to have any other different merge operator you're just not allowed to do that in IFDS so these two limitations uh, even though they allow IFDS allows you to, to define a large class uh, of, of analyses, uh, these two limitations sort of prevent you from defining certain analyses uh, in, in using IFDS. Uh, a prime example for that is linear constant propagation. Uh, and in linear constant propagation, you basically have uh, both of them. Uh, you don't want to have union to be your, your merge operator, you might want to define it in a different way, and you also have an infinite domain, uh, or a very large domain, in, even if you limit it to max int or something of that sort, uh, um, in, in your analysis. Um, so we talked about what, how can we solve that, oops. We talked about how we can actually uh, how we can actually solve that 
through defining another framework that is a higher level of abstraction over IFDS, which is called IDE, Interprocedural Finite Distributive Environments. So we are no longer defining <clears throat> Uh, we are no longer defining interprocedural distributive finite distributive subset problems. We are defining environments uh, that are going to be uh, transformed from one statement to the other based on the functions that uh, um, that that define our analysis. Um, we had a quick example there uh, towards the end of the lecture uh, that shows the difference between how IFDS will define functions or will create the summary for a function versus what a summary would look like in IDE. Uh, and we said that in IDE, there's basically two phases that the algorithm goes through. The first phase is to generate context-independent information, uh, basically creating the method summaries or generating the method summaries that are going to be used. In the second phase, you apply those summaries to context, uh, various contexts that you have, so that you can get uh, context-dependent information. And then we walk through an example of linear constant propagation uh, where uh, which we were trying to generate the summary of a method. And this is where we stopped at last time. Uh, we stopped at last time uh, at a point where we were trying to create uh, the method summary uh, for this function here. And we said that the way we're going to do that is in, in IDE, we basically annotate all the edges along the exploded supergraph with functions. Uh, we're going to call those jump. Uh, we're going to call those uh, transfer functions um, that define the side effect of a certain statement on the data flow. And then, if you want to create the jump function, which is basically the equivalent in IDE of a path edge or a path summary in IFDS, uh, the way we're going to uh, create that jump function is going to be the composition of all the transfer functions along that path, uh, which is that red uh, marked uh, value here. And this is going to be our jump function uh, for, that, uh, uh, for that path there. <clears throat> so this is where we stopped at last time in our lecture. And we're going to continue on uh, from there uh, with, the, uh, uh, with today's lecture as well. But before I do so, like, do you have any questions about this brief summary of previous lecture? All right. Sounds good. <clears throat> so similar to IFDS, we're going to continue with creating those jump functions. And basically, the jump function that you're going to create from, uh, let me use a different color here. Oops. Uh, yeah, let's try to use this one. So basically, the way we're going to create the method summary is we want to compute the merge function or the jump function from the beginning of the method. Oh, okay. Maybe. Oh, there we go. So the way we're going to create the, um, the method summary is we want to find out the jump function from the beginning of the method all the way to its last statement. If we can find that jump function, this jump function will be the method summary. So this is going to be our method summary. So the way we're going to do that is that we're going to compute jump functions as we go after each statement. And then once we have the final jump function, this is going to be our method summary. So let's take a few examples here uh, to find out what the jump functions are. So if we can, uh, let me just erase this for a second here. And, and just try to compute some of those jump functions. So this jump function here, we just uh, computed. Uh, if we move on to that function um, inc, this inc function here, uh, there are basically multiple jump functions that we want to create. 
Well, there is this jump function. Uh, let's use a different color for that. Uh, let's use this. There is this jump function, right? Well, with the value v b, uh, there is also this jump function. Uh, maybe use a different color for that as well. <coughs> There is this jump function, uh, and there is also the the self loop for this. So let's try to compute all of these jump functions. So the first jump function we want to compute is basically going to be uh, that jump function here. So this jump function. Uh, So this jump function is going to be what? What would, that, what would that jump function look like? If I want to create that yellowish jump function here, what would that be? Following up from our lecture last time. Just ID, right? Why would it be just ID? Well, let's, let's see. So we have this ID here, this ID here, and this ID here. So this is going to be ID composed with ID composed with ID. Um, and this is basically equivalent to just ID. So this is going to be ID. All right then. What about the second jump function, that blue one? What would that jump function look like? What would it be? <clears throat> so lambda i equals i plus 1. Okay, why would it be lambda i equals i plus 1? How did you compute that? That is the red line composed with id twice. Perfect. So the way I'm going to compute this blue jump function, I'm just going to follow the functions along those edges, compose them together, and then see what the output that I'm going to get. So this is going to be lambda i equals i plus 1, composed with id, composed with id. Basically, those two function compositions basically go away because they are identity, and then I'm going to get lambda i equals i plus 1. So this here basically represents that jump function. And then this here represents that jump function here. And I have my jump functions for these two. So those jump functions to exit points become the summary functions of my, of my function inc. So if you want to represent ink and you want to know what the summary of ink is, well, it's going to be th these two jump functions are going to be my method summary. The equivalent of the path edges that we had in IFDS. Is that clear so far? All right, great. So what I can actually do now is I can represent these functions in a, in a different way. I can basically say... and. Let's see if that actually again works this time. Uh, I can say that I'm going to get this here. To copy all that. Ah. Paste. And this is going to be our new function. So we're going to remove this, and we're going to remove that. We're going to remove this, and we're going to remove all these. We're going to remove that as well. Remove all these, remove that, that. <coughs> And that, 
and then here is what we're going to write instead. So here, this here, we have our first jump function for ink. Then we have another jump function here for V. And then the jump function for R is going to be this, which actually originates from here. This is going to be lambda i equals i plus 1. So now this is going to be our method summary. This here is going to be our method summary. For, for the method increment. All right, so now that we have that, we can actually go back and plug that summary in. So now we, we finished basically more or less kind of phase one for this, or at least computed the method summary for, for ink that we can then apply to different contexts, meaning different call sites here in, um, uh, in, uh, in our main method that we have in our program. So what are we going to do now? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out uh, whether we can, uh, whether like how, how the data is going to flow or propagate along the lines, uh, along, along the paths, the different paths that we have in the program based on our call and call to return and so on. So a couple of the things that we're going to have is we're going to be having two things. First thing is we're at the first call site here, at this call site, at that first call site. So we have a couple of things. One thing would be the flow of the data through the call, so through all these path edges or jump functions that we have, and then we have the return from the call, very similar to IFDS. So we have call to call flow, you have return flow, and you have the call to return, like flowing through uh, that path, uh, th that, that call site. So the first path that we're going to have is a path that basically goes here and then flows through here and then flows to here. So this is all ID. This is not a problem. The second is if I'm going to call that method, I'm going to have this here. So let me let me have a different again another color for that. Uh, let's see which color should I use for this one. Uh, let's use this. And let me erase that so that we have different color. So I just want to call this the path. So the path that we are taking here is going to be well. Lambda i equals zero, composed with id, right? This id, composed with that id, composed with this id here, right? So this is our first one. So lambda i equals zero, composed with id, composed with id, composed with id. Then the other path is the path that I might take uh, here, which is going to be, uh, let's use, oh, that's not that different, maybe use this one. So the other path is going to be, again, lambda i equals zero, composed with id, composed with id, composed with id, well, no, that's not true. So lambda i equals zero, composed with id, composed with id, composed with, oops, lambda i equals i plus one, right? And that will summarize the second path that I have in, 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 in our program, uh, in, in, in that function here. Does that make sense so far? All right. <clears throat> we
we are reading composition from left to right um, what do you mean by we are reading composition for left, from left to right ah yes you are actually correct so I made a mistake here in the sense that uh, let me see how I can I fix this without changing a lot of things, but seems I can't. So, so basically, okay, let me erase those paths because the composition is done in reverse. Uh, this is actually a very good point uh, that you raised there. The composition should be done from right to left. I just made a mistake in, in, in doing the composition properly. So let me redo that again. So the way we're going to do this is going to be this path is going to be represented by lambda i equals zero, right? Composed with id, composed with id, composed with id, right? This is going to be our first path then the second path that we have is going to be the second path that we have is going to be uh, lambda i equals i plus one composed with id composed with id No, something is not adding up. This is again going to be lambda i equals zero, right? Composed with id, composed with id, composed with lambda i equals i plus one. This is going to be our function composition for that second path. Does that make sense? All right then, so th thanks for catching that out. So these are going to be the, the, the two paths that we are going to follow uh, for, um, for, this, uh, for, for this function here. So before we actually compute the, 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 the data flow in, in this IDE problem, we're going to simplify a few things as we go. So the first thing we're going to simplify is we're going to define the uh, the jump function before the call. So basically, we want to have a jump function for right before the call. What would that jump function be? And that jump function would be oh sorry that that's not what I meant. And that jump function would be basically this jump function here, right? So this jump function will just be id composed with id, and this will just give us id. So we can actually, just again to simplify things a little bit, just remove these here, remove that, and make that just a jump function, and give that a name called id right so we are replacing all the intermediate again just like we did with the on the fly exposed super gap construction replacing all the edges uh, from the transitions the intermediate transitions with the jump functions in ifds we did that with the path summaries or the path edges but here we're doing that with the jump functions so now we have this id as before the call uh, then we have here we basically have a jump function as well, right? So this here is going to be a jump function. And maybe we can draw this with the red color so that it resembles the ID that we have. And this will be lambda i equals zero. So this is going to be our uh, jump function here for that path. <coughs> 
So far, so good? All right. Sounds good then. So, the next thing that we're going to compute is going to be um, um, the function composition, basically. Uh, sorry, we, so now we have computed all the function compositions uh, along these paths, and the way we're going to merge uh, um, um, uh, jump functions from multiple paths is uh, going to depend on how you're going to define your merge operator. So how are we going to define a merge operator? Well, let's see. So now we want to define our merge operator. So here in our merge points, how do we define the merge operators? Um, it depends, it depends on your kind of analysis, but the, the, the thing here about um, uh, IDE is that you can define a merge operator that doesn't necessarily have to be set union, uh, and you're going to compute your jump functions through the function composition. So if you go back to our same example here, uh, the way we're going to define our uh, function composition is going to be, uh, well, I'm not going to take the same example, I'm just going to take um, a slightly different example. So let's say t equals zero, and then you have some condition here, then based on that condition you'll do something, otherwise you're going to do something else, and then we're going to print our result. We're just going to print t afterwards. Uh, let's see. And then again, um, we're going to say t++, plus plus, perhaps, you're going incrementing this. Uh, so basically what you can have is, uh, you can have a lambda i equals zero from one path, basically, which is going to be the path that summarizes this edge here. Um, and you compose that with well, maybe I should actually just just give me a, couple, a minute here just to draw the the full exploded super graph here. So here we have what? Here we have our uh, tautology, and here we have t. So right before and right after the statement, we are just going to use id here. Here we have our lambda i equals zero because we are assigning zero to t. Uh, and then because of the if statement, uh, we are going to have id here for the tautology as usual uh, and then we're going to have again this uh, sorry uh, this should be id not the same function again this should be id but then because of that uh, condition here or that statement we're going to go through that uh, and this should be for uh, t plus plus This goes here, and this goes here. And then after that statement, it just basically continues the propagation forward with ID, ID, this is going to be ID, this is going to be ID, identity, most of them are going to be identity. Uh, but actually this one here is the one where we increment t by one, so basically lambda i equals i plus 1, right? Because we are incrementing whatever the input is, is going to be incremented by 1. And we're moving forward with that. And then we are returning back here with this and returning back here with this. And then moving forward with identity function, moving forward with the identity function as such. So we're going to do the same thing here. Uh, the difference would be that at this point, so basically, if we are taking the if statement, we're going to in implement the increment. And this is what the uh, flow that you're seeing, the data flow that you're seeing represents. But the other part of the data flow is that, 
and I'm just going to draw this in dotted line here, is that if you are not taking the if condition, if you're taking the false branch, what would be the value of t? It would be the value of t as, as such as before. So this is going to be id, right? This is going to be the value of uh, t from before. So what we are going to do is we are going to create... Oh, did I copy things twice? I don't know. All right. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two, uh, I basically want to find out two jump functions. I want to find out this jump function, right? And I want to find out this jump function or this path. Oh, maybe I should use a different color for that as well. And I want to find out this jump function. And then at that merge point, I can just say, well, I'm going to do the jump function in, in green and I'm going to merge that with the jump function in yellow. And that will give me whatever value that I'm going to propagate forward. So let's find out what these jump functions are actually. I'm, I'm going to need your help here. Just take me a while to erase all that. All right. So the green jump function, what would that value of the green jump function would be? So let me, let me pull this further. So what would be the, the value of the green jump function? Lambda i equals e is equal to pulse with id a few times, right? So this will be lambda, well, if I want to be exact or correct, this will be lambda i equals 0, composed with this id, composed with this id, and basically that will give us lambda i equals 0. Right, so the value of t would be 0. Now, if I want to create the other jump function, what would that jump function be? And I did a mistake here in that path. So this is not that actually. This should be that. And this should be here. So this path here is this path. Just to be correct here. Since it is lambda i equals 1, since it is lambda i equals 0, composed with some id, composed with lambda i, i plus 1. All right. So how do we come up with that? So it is going to be lambda i equals 0, composed with this id, composed with this id, composed with lambda i equal i plus 1. So if you compose all these functions together, well, i is equal to 0. Those ids basically don't do anything. i is equal to 0 composed with lambda i equals i plus 1 will yield lambda i equals 1. So if I want to compute this value here, this is how, I, how I'm going to find out this value. So basically, what does this uh, function, uh, what does this merge say here about the fact? Basically, the merge here says... I have a path where the value of t is going to be 0, another path where the value of t is going to be 1. 
So one way I can, I can find this function composition is I can say, well, it could be zero, it could be one. So one way I can say this is, well, given this i, this is equivalent to saying, well, I don't know actually. And there is one symbol here that we can use for that, which is top. So if we think about the lattice of elements that we have, right, for constant propagation, it is 0, 1, 2, right, 3, all the way up to max int. So if you find the merge of, or basically the join of uh, 0 and 1 in this lattice here, it would give you top. So if you compose these two functions together, you're going to get top. So you're going to get the composition, the function composition of these will, lead, will yield the function that, given any input, will return top to you. Does that make sense so far? So, moral of the story is, this merge operator here will greatly depend on um, how you define um, your, your merge operator for your lattice. So again, this goes back to the lattice theory lectures that we have discussed in the class a while back. So, if, and going, going, going back to Jack's comment, why not 0 and 1? Well, it could be if our lattice is, is different than, than this lattice here. So if our lattice, for example, is something like that, well, 0, 1, but then the top for 0 and 1, or the, the join of 0 and 1 is the integer uh, range 0 and 1, uh, and then basically here 2, you're going to have 1 and 2, um, and then so on and so forth, then yes, this is going to be your value. But remember that the for linear constant propagation, our lattice is this lattice here. The lattice where you have one bottom element, one top element, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the integers that we have until max int. And this goes all the way back to what we discussed in our previous lecture. This was our lattice here. But yes, you could Theoretically speaking, if we are using a different lattice, we could actually have our uh, result here uh, to be lambda i equals just the range 0 and 1. And again, this is one of the uh, uh, features in IDE that overcome the limitation in IFDS that you could not define um, uh, um, um, merge functions other than set union. Uh, but here, basically, your merge function is, is bounded by whatever your lattice is, is, is capable of, of representing and abstracting. Um, it's more than halfway through the class time, so let's just take a few minutes break. Um, if you have any questions about this, we can discuss them further after the break. Uh, if you want to type it up right now during the break, and then I can, I'll get back to it as soon as we're back, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but I'm going to give a quick recap also after we come back from the break. So let's just take a few minutes break and then maybe reconvene in three to four minutes from now. So 1.23 or 1.24 Edmonton time. PM, that is.
All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, let's continue with our uh, remainder of the lecture. So before the break, uh, we discussed a couple of new things in IDE. Uh, we discussed how we can create method summaries by basically creating the jump functions of all the paths as we go uh, through the program in a very similar fashion to what we did in IFDS. Uh, we create that jump function by just doing a function composition of all the functions along that path. Um, and the, uh, those jump functions from the entry point of the method until its exit points represent the method summary that we can just uh, then apply to various contexts. In this case here we had two paths that we, that we, that we got out of this. Um, merge points, the way we're going to define them, uh, it is flexible enough as long as uh, those merge points, the, the merge operator we're using is, uh, could be defined given the lattice that we have defined for our analysis domain, as opposed to IFDS where your basically merge, merge operator it has to be the set union. So in this case we can define our merge operator to be just the uh, uh, join operator of our, uh, of our lattice. Uh, since we're using a lattice that basically defines a top and a bottom element and then all integers as uh, elements in the lattice that are bounded by this, this top and bottom element, uh, if we have a jump function that tells us that uh, the given input will be zero, uh, the, uh, the side effect of that jump function will be lambda i equals zero, uh, the other jump function is lambda i equals one, then when we merge these two jump functions, it will give us lambda i equals top. Uh, if this lattice, had this lattice been defined in a different way, uh, we could get an integer uh, range, basically, where it says that uh, lambda i is equal to 0, 1, the range between 0 and 1. But then we'd have to define our, our, la our uh, lattice in a different way. So depending on the type of the lattice that you have, you're going to get a different result for this merge operator. So now we have seen a way to define both uh, merge operators in a different way than IFDS and also uh, uh, define lattices that could be finite uh, uh, in, their, in, their, in their length. Uh, so let's actually draw a quick comparison between IFDS and IDE based on the explanation that we had in the lecture today and last week as well. So in IFDS we define flow functions, right, that represent the data flow or the effect of each statement on the data flow. Um, in IDE, we define edge functions. Sometimes they're also called transfer functions uh, because these are basically the functions that we annotate on the edges and then we do compose them along the way to compute the uh, path edge or um, uh, the jump functions, the equivalent of path summaries. Here in IFDS we have to define a lattice. In IDE we also have to define a lattice, but we need to define a merge operator. In IDFDS it's basically the set union. And here we also have to compose um, We have to compose uh, for, or sorry, not for. To compose to compute the jump functions. So this is the difference here between IDE and IFDS. A couple of other differences here between both of them is um, not really differences, but you can think of it as every IFDS problem can be defined as an IDE problem, but I mean not the other way around. So how how are we going to do that? So if you want to, if, if I want to say, let's have an IFDS problem, transform that or define that as an IDE problem, we can define that as such. We can define that as an environment that maps 
uh, into a binary domain. whether it's top or bottom. Uh, and then basically, effectively, it will be uh, a characteristic function depending on your data flow, whether this is going to be true or false, more or less. Uh, and the semantics would be that a certain node in IFDS will be reachable from the graph if it is, uh, if it is mapped to top or bottom or vice versa, depending on how you are going to define that. And then you can use identity functions in all the other edges where uh, the data flow is not affected uh, by that specific statement here. And in fact, actually, if you, if you look up some of the static analysis frameworks we have discussed in the class, like uh, Soot, like uh, uh, Walla, we, we haven't gone into too much details about Walla, but there's also Walla and there's also Dupe, you'll find that um, the solver that, that solves for uh, distributive uh, interprocedural dis finite distributive problems is actually implemented as an IDE solver and then IFDS is a special instance of it because you can express any IFDS problem as an IDE problem but not the other way around. So you can sort of have one algorithm in IDE and then if you want to define an IFDS problem there is a simple transition from that to be applicable and solvable by an IDE solver. Um, one thing that we haven't really uh, discussed into great detail and I, and I deliberately wanted to discuss that later after we discussed IDE is um, in IDE, if you remember from previous lectures, last lecture specifically, it is interprocedural finite distributive environment. Why is it called environment? It is really called environment because the way those edge functions or transfer functions are defined is it is not affecting a single element in the lattice. It is applied to the whole lattice. It's a function that you apply to all the elements of the lattice, to the whole lattice, and you get as an output another lattice after it has been transformed due to the side effect of that function. So in other words, if we have an example here, so in this example, here we have an element A. Uh, this element A goes to uh, maybe A, uh, and then goes to another point here that maybe this is B. Uh, this is ID, for example, and this is lambda I equals I plus one. Uh, so the way this is gonna work is, we're gonna start with A is mapped to zero, right? Uh, then B is gonna be mapped to two. So this is our, uh, maybe I should draw this like that. A is mapped to zero and B is mapped to two. When you apply this, uh, <coughs> sorry, this is one here. When you apply this environment or this transfer function here, this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get A mapped to zero and then B mapped to two. So it is not that you're going to get a single element as an output from applying the function, but you're going to get a new environment. So this is environment input, let's call this E, and this is gonna be called E prime. So you're gonna, you're gonna get a new environment E prime, which is the resulting environment after applying that jump function to the input environment. And the functions associated with the statement uh, are, di are distributive over the environment transformer. So you can apply those functions uh, distributively over, over the environments that you are uh, that, 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 that you have in your in your uh, in your analysis abstraction. Um, a note on complexity here, uh, if you remember from IFDS, IFDS had the complexity of a uh, big O of uh, the size of the explored supergraph, uh, sorry, the number of edges that you have multiplied by the number of uh, the, the analysis, your analysis domain. In IDE, uh, you compose that domain into both uh, D and L, where, where D is basically uh, the domain, the elements in your analysis, uh, uh, sorry, um, D is, uh, uh, so this D basically in IDE 
will be composed of two things, your values in your program and your lattice elements. However, the complexity of the ID algorithm no longer depends on the lattice elements. It primarily depends on the number of variables that you have in your program, which means that you can have an infinite lattice, but still IDE would be would have this complexity here. Basically, a similar complexity to IFDS, but um, it is no longer expressed in terms of the size of the lattice, but rather expressed in the size of the number of values that you have in your program. So independent of the size of the lattice, you still have the same complexity, so that's really the big win here. All right, uh, this is all what I had to say about IDE, really. Uh, so a quick recap about IDE. Uh, it's a distributive, uh, you define distributive uh, 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 environment transformers, edge functions. You try to compute jump functions by having the function composition along a certain path. If you have multiple paths you want to merge them, you're going to use a merge operator that primarily depends on your merge operator that is defined within your lattice. Uh, you can have whatever merge operator you want in IDE as opposed to only subset problems or subsets or union, uh, union, union, set union in, in, in IFDS. Um, IDE allows you to define infinite uh, lattices with infinite uh, lengths, just like in linear constant propagation, which is not possible to do in IFDS, which is one of the limitations of IFDS. Um, um, as long as you can define uh, your function composition and merge uh, operator uh, to be to have a finite representation, then you'll be fine with IDE. So you can define things like linear constant propagation, no problem at all. Uh, in practice, most of the solvers uh, define IDE solvers that can then also solve for IFDS problems by having a, a simple transformer that transforms an IFDS problem into an IDE problem. <clears throat> That's all I had really for IFDS and IDE and distributivity and <clears throat> these two major frameworks that um, are along with the monotone framework, the, the, this, these are really the main three um, theoretical frameworks that are the cornerstone of program analysis. Monotone framework is for intra-procedural analysis within a method, IFDS and IDE and all the other abstractions that come on top of them are for inter-procedural analyses analyses that span the whole program. Um, that's all I had for you today, actually. It's rather a short class, so I can spare you a few more minutes. Um, I'm happy to take any questions in the remainder of the class time, but that's all I had for you today, so thank you very much. Right. Would there ever be a reason to still use IFDS then? Is it more efficient when the lattice is small plus finite, but you have a lot of variables to work with? Uh, it depends what you mean by use IFDS. Do you mean define your analysis um, as an IFDS problem, or you mean in practice, like to use an IFDS solver? In practice, there isn't really much of a difference because like, as I said, it's basically an IDE solver in disguise that is solving for an IFDS problem. Um, in theory or on paper, it might be a bit simpler because you can just get away with defining your flow functions. You don't have to worry about environments, edge functions, transfer functions, function composition, all these kind of things like just go away basically uh, w when you're talking about IFDS. So you don't have to worry about them that much. Um, so there is less complexity theoretically speaking. Uh, practically speaking, the solvers are basically IDE solvers that solve for IFDS problems as well. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> cool. Any other question or comment? Whether about topics, content, or project, or paper seminars? Sure, sure. You don't have to do for any language of any sort. You can do whatever you want, really. So if you want to use LLVM, go for it. If you want to use 
the, I, I see why this question came up because many of the examples I have are, are Java based or Java like or related to frameworks in Java, but you definitely do not have to restrict yourself to Java. I would even strongly recommend against that. Try something completely different that you haven't seen in the class. If you want to analyze Python, go for it. If you want to analyze JavaScript and have the courage to do so, go for it. If you want to do something for Rust or Scala or, I don't know, WebAssembly or binary, go for it. Try something crazy. That's, this is your opportunity to try something completely crazy in a course project and, and, and get to have some fun with it and enjoy your time with it without having to worry too much about the consequences. You basically have five weeks, maybe, maybe a bit, maybe six weeks to try something out. So make use of the time. No problem. All right. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> Uh, I'm gonna make available that uh, note that I was typing up in, on, on my iPad here for this week's lectures. So I'm gonna make it available also on the, uh, on the lecture notes uh, website on GitHub so that you can have access to it as well. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, have a nice weekend, I guess. And uh, looking forward to your proposal documents on Friday and the presentations on Tuesday next week. Best of luck to you all. See you then.